Our Father, we thank you. That's just what you are. You know, bribe you, we can't bribe you. You are Yahweh. Jehovah Sekenu. We thank you. You are our banner, our righteousness, our healer, our peace. You are everything good to us because you are good. We have come to learn of you. We don't want just to see, but to hear you. More than that, we want you to make yourself manifest to us. You are hidden in your word. Come out of your hiding, O God. The Bible says you are the Lord God that hides himself. And yet you said, you will make yourself manifest to the person who keeps your word. We've come to learn. We would go into some specifics today. Don't forget that Jesus Christ himself is the wisdom of God. So there's no way we can fully exhaust any teaching on God's wisdom. But we will never overteach it. It's not possible. Because every second you wake up to see, you are under pressure to apply that same wisdom everyone has. Everybody's under that pressure. Every man, every human being is under pressure to do it as every other person does it. Hallelujah. So we want to see. We want to see how Jesus was able to handle the same challenges we are today faced with. Because he said in Matthew 11, he said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. So that is crucial. The whole of church, the whole essence of church is that people be taught or be explained to how Jesus navigated this earth so that we may all learn of him. There's no gathering on earth of God's people that can be outside learning of him. Even when it's time for miracles, signs and wonders, and people need miracles just as I do and every other person does, the reason for miracles is that people may still learn of him. He uses miracles to draw people to himself. Hallelujah. And that's why no real Christian, no certified child of God should live on miracles. Because you should go beyond miracles. Because miracles are actually the normal things that should follow your life without any much ado. It's not something you look fast, if it's so scarce. No, it's something that should be following you. These signs shall follow those who believe. It is clear. So even when you are going through the worst difficulty, you are still having a miracle. And you are still working miracles. Amen. Amen. Didn't Joseph, Joseph work miracles in the, in the prison? When it should be the, the saddest of them all. He was still doing great things in prison. But today's Christian, any little challenge, he stops ministering to other people. He's so downcast, he's so, in, you know, I mean, disconsolate that he does not know he has a ministry to that person sitting by him in the same vehicle. He is so sad, he's so disconsolate, he's so disheartened that he forgets that God still wants to send him to some place for God's own pleasure. So we have found ourselves being such that we are controlled, our mood is controlled by the things we enjoy or do not enjoy. It's a sad commentary. Even when you are in the worst fiery furnace of affliction, when you are passing through the worst moment in life, you are still a miracle. One, say amen. amen. And you are still meant to give miracles to other people that will come your way. This is the will of God. Hallelujah. That's how it should be. No moment of your life should be given to the enemy because of what you are going through. Joseph wouldn't let anything weigh him down when he should be weeping every day. He should have been depressed for having been accused and convicted of what he never did. 
Are we together? So we are look, trying to look into how those people, even in a Jesusless era, you would say, were able to overcome life's vicissitudes, life's challenges. How was Joseph able to handle it? Oh, you've forgotten that story. Today we talk of depression as if it's, a, it's the, a, the tea we have to drink as Christians. And I, I keep wondering, what's happening to us? Not as if I'm a superman, I'm not a superman, no. But we have all it takes in scriptures to navigate. They had no scripture to read in their own time. We are the ones now reading about them. What has gone? I won't say wrong. It is well with us in Jesus' name. Somebody just goes on vacation, just gets angry. You know, even when Elisha was sick unto death, he still wrought miracles. The king ran to him and said, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And the sick Elisha sat up from his sick bed. Wow. He said, Hold the bows, the bow and the arrows. Face that side, the sick man. Oh my God. I came today with my heart bleeding. That I might be able to communicate these mysteries to somebody in Jesus' name. Amen. Not to talk as though I'm a superman. I'm not a superman. I am not. I've never been. And I will never be. But that this God in you is all you need. Even when you are the lowest in life, you can still pull people up to the uppermost point of life. Even when you are the lowest level. If you are so down that, you know, you shouldn't want to greet anybody. But that's when you are ministering to people, setting people free. <laughs> and they wonder. We are aware of what has just happened to him. It's not even showing on his face. And they will say, oh, don't you know him? Don't you know her? She's strong in the Lord. That's your portion in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's not only when there's a testimony, we are excited. No, that's babyish. That's childish. When the worst pains are inflicted on you, you are still helping people out of their own pains. As if you have no pain at all. That is maturity. Yeah. Oh, yes. But because today's preachers, and I'm not talking to anybody, people have asked me, like when a camp meeting, a very good person sent a question and said, are you, is it only in GMC God is? Hmm. What a question. That must be a very good person, a loved one to ask that question. And I love people who ask questions. At least when you ask, wait for the answer. We are not saying so. And I said, you bad person doesn't know me. I keep saying there are many things I don't know. But you see, we have to be blunt with ourselves and not give ourselves palliatives. We must let ourselves know, look, these things are doable. Amen. They are doable. If I open my wounds to you, you'll be afraid. The wounds have sustained in ministry. The injuries have sustained. <laughs> you'll be wondering, how? So, but we've got to teach the world Let's look at the apostles. How did they do it? Acts of the apostles. No, it didn't stop with them. The acts have continued to happen. Oh. We're talking of the acts of, 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 of. That's it. The acts have not stopped. Because it's actually the acts of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the apostles. Not their own acts. Oh my God. It should have been the acts of the Holy Spirit in the last of the apostles. My first book is The Acts of the Holy Ghost in Human Affairs. Get a copy of that book. It will set you on fire again. Please. So we need to learn of him. He said, learn of me. Take my yoke upon you. What is a yoke? It's bondage. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to, to, to verse 30. Take my yoke. That yoke is some kind of restriction. It says, I will not impose it on you as Satan imposed his on you when you were in bondage serving him. Now that I have set you free, you, are, you have given your life to me and I've, you, know, you are born again. It now says, make it your choice to take my own yoke, my own restriction, my own bondage. Take it upon you. Bind yourself 
take this yoke on you, restrict yourself so that you can no longer go where you like to go. You can no longer do what you feel good to do. You feel like slapping somebody four times because you've taken his yoke upon you. You, are, you say, hmm, thank you, Lord. And you say, I, I, I just love you. Hmm. I just love you. Thank you. Somebody should have slapped four times. That somebody has taken upon himself the yoke of Christ. It's not, that's, it says, I will never impose my yoke on you. You are to take it upon yourself. Look at it. Take my yoke upon you and do what? Learn. Now, this one says from me. Another one says of me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now, you see, the implication is if you don't take his yoke upon you, you will never learn of him. That's why today we have many teachers and learners. Because they are too wonderful to take the yoke of Christ on themselves. It's only those who have voluntarily restricted themselves because they've taken his yoke upon themselves that can learn of him. Look at this mission now. Only those who have taken his yoke upon themselves by not going to where they should have gone to. Only those ones are here. This part of the yoke of Christ, when you should be elsewhere for good reasons, and yet you are here. Not because you are idle. You're not idle. You are too busy to come here. You could and should have been elsewhere doing something legitimate, something powerful. But because you chose to take upon yourself the yoke of Christ, it's easy for you to come here to learn of him. Amen. Amen. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, then you will find rest for your souls. No one finds rest for their soul and still goes into depression. Not anyone. I've not found any. It's because people are restless. Why are they restless? They have not learned of him. Why have they learned? They have refused to take his yoke upon them. They are too polished. They are too powerful to be restricted. And he says, well, I have set you free from Satan's bondage that you may not be free again. Yeah. Yeah. We are too free to mess around. That's why he's saying, take my yoke on you, that your freedom may be totally tied to me. It's only where I am you are found. Oh, God. Permit me to say this. Please permit me. I'm not trying to sound immodest here. My son just graduated in, in school. I said Lagos. So if you know where he is. I should have been there with my wife. Excuse me, I should have been there. Not for lack of money. I waited till it was graduation day. No approval came from my master. This thing sound like, what are you talking about? Because I'm to be where he is. Now, that does not mean the person that went is where God is not. No, we are, John 12, 26 says, if anyone, John 12, 26, if any man serves me, Jesus said so. Let him follow me. For where I am, there also will the person serving me be. Oh. So it is where he is as it concerns me that I should be found if I'm really serving him. Now. Ah, it's getting too white now. Mm, okay. In Matthew 18. When the, the when disciples came to ask him, who is the greatest among us? Tell us. We want to know who the greatest is. Look at. They were so, so adrift. They were so low and dull that they began to have strife among themselves. Who is next to you? Who is your deputy? We need to know. But let me said, Philip met me here. He cannot claim to be closer to you than I am. James and John said, we know what, we left our nets and our dad to follow you. We didn't, delay. We didn't even say bye-bye to our daddy. How can somebody claim to be holier than us? It's not possible. Tell us who the greatest is. <laughs> now look at him. Next verse. Jesus called a little child. Oh God. Ah, I don't know. I, 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 I just don't know. I wish I could just, ah, God. This was handled in the camp, if we were there. He called a loser to him, not to them. This is to show how humble a child is. And that is what he's teaching us here. The child was going somewhere. 
But because Jesus called him, the child, as it were, put the yoke of Christ upon him, upon himself. That means his freedom to go where he was going was stopped. How many of us can be so called or sent for or sent anywhere? That's the challenge. If God cannot stop you where you are and change your direction, then you are too big for him to bless. The God we are working with is not the God you can just toy with. He's, this is grace we're enjoying, of course. If not for his grace, we will have been dead before now because of our, our obstinate behavior, because of the way we, we just have become rascally. And we call it grace. No, please. He called a child to him. Set the child in the midst of them. If you are asked to work with some members of a community, do you know you may not function because somebody is there. Somebody told me, said, Pastor Muiwa, well, I like to be in your church. <laughs> I said, I don't have a church. Well, well, well I, I want to be in GMC. But as long as that person, and he mentioned the person's name, is in your church, I cannot join you. And I asked, what am I now to do? Send the person away because of you to advise me. He said, well, I'm not saying so, but I can see that we are many that want to join you, but that person is the reason we will not join. I said, well, I'm sorry. I can't because of all of you send one person away because the Lord brought the person. But ironically, that person eventually is no longer here. And I have yet to see any of those people wanting me to have sent him away or sent her away. Can you see how man is? How big man thinks he is. And he now said, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, not as this child. In other words, all little children are easily controlled. This is just one of them. Oh, my God. He should have said, be as converted as, and become as this child. He said, no. This child is just one of the little children that would always eagerly stop their journey if an elder stops them. He said, you by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Next one. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child. Oh, this is the challenge we have. Why is there no rest to our souls? It's because of one word that is missing, humility. Oh, yeah, that's, that's no other reason. It's not because of lack of money. There's no money. No, 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 no. It's, <laughs> in fact, okay, okay, we'll look at that today. Whoever humbles himself, whoever humbles himself, it's, it doesn't say whoever goes for deliverance. Ah, oh, God. People go for deliverance and they're still cocky and proud. And they will still go down. Because the death of a witch in your life does not translate to your automatic progress. That a witch has fallen and died does not mean you will now do well. So we, why should the life or death of a witch determine my progress? I don't believe that. No, that which is not empowered to determine how I make progress in life. He said, you, you set a table before me in whose, in whose presence of my enemies. So if they are all dead, then there will be no one to watch me eat well. What are we talking about? Go for deliverance? For de deliverance from what? It's in scriptures. As I'm talking, you are being delivered already. Because the biggest bondage you have is you. No man anywhere. I've read the Bible too. And I listen to other people preach. Don't be deceived. The challenge is that there's no humility. If the Lord should tell you, move. In Acts 8, he told Philip, he said, move to the place called desert. Gaza. Bam! Philip arose. No argument. <laughs> Today's child of God. You know, we struggle with that instruction. One day the Lord said to me, get to so 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 place by so so time. And I said, Lord, I don't have time left. The distance between here and there is so much. The time you are talking to me now, when I get there, how do I? I've not gone to the bathroom. You know, 
as I was trying to clean myself up, it occurred to me I didn't have to go to the bathroom. Oh, are you getting me? This is where we miss God. You, you incorporate your own aesthetics into God's plan. No. That's how we handle God. If I go to the bathroom, if I do the makeup, the makeover, the make down, oh my gosh, eh, ow. You, you say, well, I will repent later. I can't appear any heart that. Who is marking you? Do you know by the time you get out there, the chariot has left you? The reason you are told to go there is no longer useful. You have left it. Ten years, you are still cyclically moving around the thing. And you say, well, I don't know what's happening. I'll go for deliverance. No. He knew why he said to you, get that so, so time. Then get dressed up. You don't have to bathe. Oh, he said, Pastor, are you an alone? No. You're teaching us not to be clean. No, these are the little things we bring into our work with God that slow us down in life. Because we're not humble enough. Does God say don't bathe? No, it doesn't say so. But if it means not bathing, to obey the instruction, please dress up. A number of times people have asked me, my wife has asked me, have you bathed? And I would say no. And you're looking so fresh. That's how my life has been. I can bathe four times a day. If he says, jump out now, I go all out there. While I'm going, I'm combing my hair. Because in the instruction, I don't know why it came. This is the way it works. Only the person as humble as that child here can be called the greatest where? In the kingdom of heaven. Ah, but how can I do my hair like this? Oh, you can just wrap it up, put inside scarf and go out. The Lord instructed you. No man there has the power or capacity to score you low and say, yes, she's not looking good. We are all too mindful of people that we, we are eager to disobey God and repent later. That's if we do at all. This, I'm trying to show you humility here. How we have not really understood it, which is such that the way we respond to God's instructions, it, it is clear we are still very, very proud. So conscious of self and other people that we ignore God's promptings. This is his wisdom. This is God's wisdom on display. He said to them, whoever, it doesn't matter how many witches are putting him down, if this person humbles himself as this little child. What does that mean? The child just answered. He was going somewhere. Come here. Stay in their midst. Journey stopped. Can your flight be postponed? Because the Lord says no. Ha, ah, thank God for this girl here. Oh God. It all works together. It's only when we want to, to have miracles, we start obeying God. No, when it was simply stupid, yet you obey God, you obeyed God. She was to give birth to this boy in the U.S., this handsome man. She was heavy with this boy. And the Lord said to me, she's not meant to travel. Ah, how do I tell a woman that has the money to travel? Visa given, approval given by the husband. Everything concerned me. I was afraid to say it. And yet she knew. She must tell me. She told me. I, I think I forgot how it happened. She can tell you later. Some of you have been told. And I asked her, must you travel? Ah, I said, eh, you know, but I want to give birth to this, to this baby there. I said, well, do you have to go? I didn't know how to tell her. You know, why was I afraid? It is still the challenge of humility. Simple. It wasn't meant to be that tough for me, but how will I tell another man's wife not to travel? Is it because my wife didn't give birth to any baby abroad? People can, but thank God for this person. At some point, she never come and said, ah, Esther, they postponed, they canceled the flight. I was happy inside me. Ah, but they said we should come back tomorrow and say, well, must you go again? <laughs> must you still go? Because I couldn't tell him don't go. 
I should have told him, told her, I mean, tell, tell her, don't go. I should have told her, but I could not. Have her. Why didn't you? I'm my husband. I'm not a husband. I have no control over her. I don't have any control over her because she's somebody's wife. I'm only her pastor. I should mind how I instruct people. This is authority. The man that could stop her is the husband that sent, that sponsored her. So I, was, I must be careful. But thank God for that person. She, she added to that. I said, hey, this man is talking like this. Hey, this man. Think of a woman that was to go abroad and give birth to a baby. She would have become a citizen by now. And one man said, do you have to go? That's humility. You will not see her prosper in business today. Oh, it's not because she had so much money to start. It's because she's been obedient when it was stupid and silly to obey. That's, they're all interwoven. All right, let's move on. Philippians 2. Philippians 2. We will have to be a bit fast from here. 2.13. Hmm. 2.13, thank you. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Please, all the translations here. What does this mean? Is God really at work in me? It says, not in your own strength. For it is God who is all the while. Now, it is God who is all the while effectively or effectually at work in you, energizing and creating in you the power of desire, power and desire, both to will and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. This is amazing. How do I put this? or put myself into this scripture. If I'm going through some tough moments, how does this scripture apply to me? That it's been God all the while, effectually at work in me. Or how do you mean? At work in me when my business just nose dived? It's God at work in when I don't know why I'm in this situation. How do you mean? This is the wisdom of God that is not found anywhere except in the world by the Holy Ghost. You cannot see that. That's why we, we say we are sent for his pleasure because the pleasure of God is good. Mm. Now, I've still explained this. Please. Let's move on. Good. Next verse. Next verse. Now, you want to wonder how does this play out? How can God be the one at work in my life? Both to will and to do. Not to do as it pleases me, but to do as it pleases him. Oh, he's only at work in me that I might eventually do what pleases him. Can you see that? All this energizing of you is only for one reason, that you eventually may do that which satisfies him, that which pleases him. After saying that, you may say, but how does that apply to me? Look at the next verse. Do all things without grumbling and fault finding and complaining against God and questioning and doubting among yourselves. Wow. Does that suggest that any time we grumble or murmur, it shows we lack knowledge of one thing that God is at work in our lives. Especially when there are things we do not understand, there are things you do not know how to explain. When you are into a season of contradictions, you just pray for somebody and they got an answer to their questions. But here you are, you are still struggling with over the same thing for five years. You are wondering what has happened to me. Nothing. It's still God at work in you. This is God's wisdom that he expects us to articulate, appreciate, and work with in our lives. He says, look, it has been God in you all the while. Even when you were down, when no one said good afternoon to you, it, when everyone, th every just, even when you also were the architect of your own trouble, how could God have been the one at work 
in you when it was you that caused your trouble. He says, wait, the reason is this. Even when you did that which was wrong, so to speak, it was still God at work ensuring that you were brought back to the center of his will for you. Oh, my God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Even when, when, it, when we gave an instruction, you knew what he told you, yet you did your own thing, he was still at work in you. He never, for that, your disobedience abandoned you. Never. It will never happen. Hebrews 13 is clear. It says, I will neither leave you nor forsake you. That's what grace means. Grace means no matter what has gone wrong with you, you are still his son. Oh, you didn't, you didn't say amen there. Yeah. That's grace. Nothing. Whatever you may have done that is the most evil of all evils, if you are born again, you are still his own child. He would never cast you away. But don't cast yourself away either. But look at it. He now says, wait. To download this properly, it says, do all things. How many things? Please answer. How many things? Ha! Huh. Do you know what that means? Do all things without grumbling, without murmuring, without fault finding, without complaining, against God and against authority. Oh, against your friends. He says, don't complain. But what do we say today? It means the moment you grumble, you are rubbishing something. God is orchestrating your own life. Oh, God. Don't forget, verse 13 says, He's been God all the while. I like that expression. That has been effectively at work in you. He's been God all this while. Whether you acknowledge him or not, he's been God at work. Uh, he said, well, even when, when I made that mistake, yes, he was right there, only that you didn't listen to him. That's why you made that mistake. He's still God now at, at work in you at the point of doing your stuff. He's still there waiting to tell you, how, why did you do that? <laughs> After saying that, he says, it's at work in you to make you have the willingness to do. He's been the one at work in you. I'll show you little things that God does for us to show that it's at work in our lives. He says, the one at work in you all the while. So that you will now be willing to do what pleases him. Even when you willfully did what pleased yourself. He says, he's still at work inside you. When you said, I know it's not good, but I will do it, and I will repent later. You know, so, I will do what I want to do. And, you know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not an idiot. I'm not born again as a fool. I will do fool. After doing that, look what's you there. Are you okay now? Have not pleased yourself? Let's go. So that he is now trying to help you so that you may be willing to do his own pleasure. Ah, oh, God. I've been crying to God to teach me this scripture. And I'm still inside, I'm still swimming in it. I don't, have, I don't know it yet. How could it have been God all this while? Something belongs to me. Somebody said, no, it is his own. And you said, I should not ask him again. I want to ask, am I a fool? Yes, of course I am. Tell somebody, you are really a fool. Oh, sorry. Let me finish. Tell, tell this person, I'm actually a fool. If you weren't a fool, you would not have been born again. Oh, God. Didn't Paul say it, we are fools for Christ's sake? It's in the Bible. He said we are fools because of Jesus. The moment I'm not a fool, you will simply operate outside God's pleasure. I tell you, you have pleased yourself. 
he will still tell you. He said, Lady Wise, now you have done, you pleased yourself. Okay. The prodigal son, didn't he please himself? I'm not a fool. I know my right. I'm going to claim my right. Mangada Yagaba. Take him, give me a portion. Oh, the dad said, Take. And he said, I'm walking away. I'm walking away. I'm walking away. I'm not a small baby. I'm okay. I'm okay. And when he came to himself and went back to the dad, dad ran to meet him. That, is, that means I have never left you as your dad. I've been the one at your work. In you. That's what it means. I've been with you. Or even when you were, went away in rebellion, I never cast you away. So when he sighted his son from afar, he ran to meet him. And when, 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 when the lawyer, the, 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 the legalistic man came back from, from his own sojourn, he said, what's happening in the house? He said, your brother is back. He said, whose brother? Sophia. Whose brother? That foolish boy. So what is happening? Sound of music. He said, even the biggest cow has been killed. Eh? He said, Kamari. Nonsense. <laughs> he didn't understand grace. That the young man was still Baba's son. And this one that never disobeyed for once was not a senior son or super son. They were still both sons at the same level. Oh God. So while he was away, it was still God at work in him that made him come back to himself. That he might do the will of the Father. Shout hallelujah. Now he now says, okay, to really get the specifics of this scripture, next verse, verse 14. says, do all things. Hey. Oh, oh, oh. Without and and oh no questions no doubting no complaining no murmuring no fault finding it will take a certified decorated fool not to grumble not to find fault or fault find not to complain just <laughs> it could be the pride in you that is shouting. Not because you want things to go better. You're just, you're just loquacious. You're just loud for nothing. This scripture is clear. It says, even when you may not like what's happening, it says, shh, you've been asked to do. It says, do without grumbling. Because you may not know where it's going to end. That it is still God at work. I'm trying to juxtapose these two very well. Ah, how can, can it be like that? Oh, the scripture is there to tie you down if you are humble enough. This is God's wisdom now. Do how many things? Ah, oh, God. Oh, God. I, I can't break it down more than this. It's for the Holy Ghost to help me teach you how it applies to you. Do all things. Oh, instruction is, let us do so, 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 pam. Okay. Who said? Okay. Ah, it cannot be done yet. Ah, it says, then you are frustrating, verse 13. It's because it's being God at work. Even what you now don't like for your good reasons is because you lack knowledge of the presence of God in the matter. That's why you are complaining, you are murmuring, you are grumbling. He says, Shh, this is flesh at work. You are above that one. God's wisdom tells you, because it has been God all the while. When things go so bad with me, I tell myself, I am the reason it's like this. I, I, I come out better. It has always been so. Why? Because I acknowledge God in the problem. When Jesus was falsely accused, he didn't go to town to say, come and hear what they say about me. No, 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 no. At the end of the day, all the accusers, where is their name? Or where are their names? <laughs> when you mention them, you mention them for derogatory things, for useless things. But the name of Jesus today, nobody can put it down. It's above other names. Because he never grumbled 
over anything. He says, when you find fault with everything, you are simply destroying God's own plan. He's been there at work in you. Oh, God. Whenever you grumble or find fault, you know, you can find fault with even this auditorium. Fault finders, they don't know it's a very bad spirit that's working in their lives. They think they are trying to. It's not about wanting to be better. It's that you have a critical spirit, a fault-finding spirit. That's why nothing is done well by your own definition. It's very from somebody who knows what to do, who knows what to say, who is knowledgeable enough and wants things to be put right. That's a different person entirely. Everyone will think they want things to go better. It's not true. So many have the fault-finding spirit, and they don't know. They have the complaining spirit. Everything, if it's not, not the way they want it, they will, they will fault it. But once it goes their way, say, no, do. As if it's on my mind. I was trying to say what you said. You are right. Oh, because it has gone his way. But let it be against what he wants. You will see everything will scatter. The moment a team loses a match, it's the referee, referee that caused it. It's the referee. It's poor officiating. It's VR that caused it. <laughs> it's VR. Nonsense. Let VR favor them wrongly. Ah, that thing is very good. That VR, thank God for that VR. You know, there's something, with, man is a dangerous being. Very, very dangerous. Only God's word sets us apart from other people. Hallelujah. Let's move on to verse 15 and I'll move on to another place. That you may show yourselves to be blameless. Wow. It says, when you do all things without grumbling, without complaint, without fault finding against God or anybody, it says, you will be able to show yourselves to be one, blameless, two, guileless. That means no craft, no koniwayo. You are just plain. People are you falsely. You still love them. You are plain. They say, you are this. I say, praise God. Thank you for that. It's because I will explain to you if you want to listen. You are just plain and transparent. You are just moving on. That you may be blameless, guileless, innocent, uncontaminated. Wow. Look at the contaminants we've been exposed to. Because of murmuring, grumbling, Fault finding. And people now go into some emotional breakdown, which is avoidable. Praise the Lord. Ah, Look at, did that child complain as to why Jesus called him? No. But if I call you now, come. Before you get up, you will have thought about 20 things. Maybe somebody has told pastor what I did yesterday. He has heard. He's been looking at me since. Now he's calling me. Hey, this man. This man. Come. Ah, okay, Pastor, I'm here. It is the pride in our heart. All of us have it. Only growth breaks it down. But a child, if I say, if Naya, come here, that child is not think of anything. She comes out innocently. But the Bible says, you can also be innocent like that. Look at. Innocent. Oh, God. Because no fault finding. If now come here, hello, pastor, good morning. She even give me a hug. Give me a smile. If I call an adult here, that's a problem. If once I look the other way, tell the person, why, why is he calling you? Why you? He should have known that he doesn't like your face. That's a challenge you must deal with. Finding fault with everything is a sign that we don't know or we refuse to know that it's God at work in our lives. Now, innocent, guileless, blameless, uncontaminated children of God without what? Blemish. Wow. Faultless, unrebukable. What? In the midst of a crooked and wicked generation, spiritually perverted and perverse, among whom you are seen as bright lights, stars or beacons, Shining out clearly in the dark world. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. No murmuring. We are just finishing 9 vigil, 3 a.m. 
The pastor is saying, all members of so 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 group will meet by four. Did you clap my face? Pastor knows I won't wait. He knows me. Of course, he knows me. <laughs> That's a fault finding spirit at work in that because she forgets that Pastor is also human who understands that people need to rest, but there should be a reason for that instruction. Oh my God. Oh God. When we complain over anything, we find fault, we rubbish. Verse 13 that says, He's been God all the while. That's been at work in you to help you to become so willing to do what God's plan is and eventually do what satisfies God. So when you are being so stretched, is that God is helping you, preparing you for something tougher ahead of you. Oh my God. Oh God. Some have told me, Pastor, you, 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 are, you, you are summoning us. You are, you are just summoning us. Yes. Because they, do, they think I'm I do. Because Pastor doesn't do anything. Ah, oh, may God have mercy on such people. Why won't he send for us? We are, does he go anywhere? Hey. We have to still love them. He's summoning us. Yeah, I will not be there. I can't. I'm just, it's, only today I have to rest. Doesn't you know you are resting? Maybe as you are stretched like that, there's a huge miracle coming. That will stretch you, even in business. And you will have been helped to handle it. That's where you've been stretched. And so if you complain about that one, and even if you did it, grumbling, no blessings. I trust God to really help somebody in Jesus' name. Look at this scripture. Nahum 1, Nahum 1, 7. Why does Philippians 2 13 talk about the good pleasure of God's will? Why is God's pleasure good? You don't know before. It's because every other pleasure is bad. Whatever pleases God must be a good one. Because God is good, amen? Now who wants seven? Says the Lord is good. So only a good God can have a good pleasure. So the will of God cannot but be good. Because God is good. Amen? Hello, church. God is a good God. Look at it. It's a strength and stronghold in the day of trouble. Now, it does not prevent trouble from coming. It's only your strength in the day of trouble. <laughs> Tell somebody you are, you are in trouble already. Tell somebody you are already in trouble. Because it, that, this tells me that trouble is real. It's coming. But he says, God is your strength in, on the day of trouble. But to this Christian, I don't want any trouble. No, 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 no. I want a church where there's no trouble. It's a lie. God will only strengthen you when trouble comes. He will never blow trouble away. Never. Tell somebody, trouble is coming to you in the name of Jesus. Ah, you see, you see. You see, you see, holy people, they're not saying amen. It's a holy woman. But it says, is a strength and stronghold in the day of trouble. 24, verse, verse 10, Proverbs. It says, if you collapse in the day of trouble, your strength is little. You, you're actually a paperweight. So we know that already. All right. If, if you faint or collapse or capsize in the day of adversity, your strength is small. So the day of trouble must come. It comes to everybody. It came to Jesus. He said, my soul is sorrowful unto death. Pray with me here. I am sorrowful unto death. He told his, his men, three men like that. Okay, back to that. No, look at it. And he said, God knows, recognizes, he has knowledge of and understands those who take refuge and trust in him. Now, I, I, I'm happy over this because he says God is good. Because he is good, his pleasure is also good. As we have also read, if that if God is good, and His pleasure is good, His will is good. What about me? Should I be a good or bad person? Psalm thirty-seven, twenty-three. Psalm thirty-seven, verse twenty-three. It says, "The steps of a good man are ordered." Wow! Tell somebody you're a good man. Sorry, he doesn't believe it. Tell the person, "I am a good man." I don't know about you. 
if you are wicked, the Lord bless you and help you. I am a good man. Some don't accept that they are good. He says the steps of a good person are directed and established by the Lord. Wow. But the next verse shocks me. If my steps are ordered, directed by the Lord, why should verse 24 happen? Read. Ah. Why should he fall? No, 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 wait, wait. Why, why should he fall? No, why should he, when his steps were already handled by the Lord, why does he have to fall? Some, for Isaiah 41, 10 says, I will uphold you with my right of righteousness. If you uphold me, why should I still fall? You now say, even if I fall, it, I will not be utterly dead. <laughs> look at fear not, nothing to fear. I'm with you. Don't look around you, you're around you in terror. Don't be dismayed. I'm your God. I will strengthen you, harden you to difficulties. I will help you. Look at this one. I will hold you up and retain you with my what? And you are telling me even if he falls, should he fall at all? My friend, there's space to fall in the grace of God. Oh, yes. Ah, you don't like to hear that one. I'm not talking of falling to sin. No, it's not about sin. It's not about sin. Not being able to get it done is a way of falling down. Having prayed and yet no answer in manifestation is a way of, it's a kind of fall. Are we together? Yes, sir. Designing this and yet you thought you had held it before it flew off. It's part of a fall. It's part of faith. John Maxwell wrote a book, Falling Forward. Failing forward, falling forward. When you fall, you are still going forward. Yeah, we all fall. One way or the other. Oh, some of you are too holy here. You have asked me first. Maybe you said, God said, yes. And so what? God said so. Man can resist God in any way. God said so. That didn't stop what God said. If somebody becomes Satan's agent and it's the position to hinder it, he can hinder it for a while. He won't stop forever. I will harden you to difficulties. Yes, I will help you. Now, back to that scripture. It says, the steps of a good person are ordered, established, directed by the Lord. Okay. Though he falls, he shall not be utterly cast down. Why? For the Lord grasps his hand in support and upholds him. I don't understand this one. So I don't care in what area you may have fallen, God is still upholding you. You know, that's, which Sunday did I preach? That they may wrong you, but they will do you no wrong. <laughs> eh? The Bible says he didn't allow any persons to do them any wrong. Not that nobody wronged them. Somebody may wrong you, but he cannot substantially do you any wrong because to do you a wrong means to successfully stop God's plan in your life. He will wrong you with all his energy, but he can never do you any wrong. He has no capacity to do that. He cannot stop God's plan for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, he shall not be utterly cast down. Oh, okay. Why? He says the Lord grasps. Now, if God grasps his end, why will he fall at all? You know, you can be holding a child. Pa, 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 baby. You have to walk briskly. Child now stumbles and, and staggers. And yet you're holding him. Okay? He might even fall to the ground. His hand may, 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 may pull out of your own hand and sustain an injury. What do you do? Pick him again. It happens in life too. Even when God's upholding you. It does not mean you will not fall at all because it's upholding you that when you fall, you say you will not be utterly cast down. Now, this, this phrase, where is it now? This phrase, utterly cast down, is the only place in the Bible, in the whole Bible. That phrase, utterly cast down. If you go to 2 Corinthians 4, 8, 4, 9 rather, it says, we are cast down but not destroyed. 
Now, utterly cast down is the ultimate. That means the person can't get up again. It's the only place where it says, even if the person falls, he will never be utterly cast down. Oh, God. Ah! Give you blow in the boxing bout. Boo, boo, boo. Okay, 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 okay. It falls. You know, why would they count 10? It's because he can still get up and win. The referee says, one, two, three, four. The man is like, four. You keep counting now. Five. Six. The referee will go to him and do that. Can you see me? And once he does that, he says, okay. Fight continues. And he might win the bout. This is, you are still you are the winner. Yeah. Tell two persons you are still the winner. Yeah. He, he, he didn't hear you. Tell the person you are still the winner. It is still you, to, you are still the winner. You are still the winner. The devil is a loser. Hallelujah. Because you've not been counted out. The referee is the Holy Ghost himself. It is never over till you have won. Now, hold it. You won before the fight started. The winner was already determined before the fight came. So what are we killing? So can we? Killing? So can we? So, if anybody thinks that put you down forever is a lie, it will. You are on put down able. Guy, because they don't know you. You can't be put down. You may fall because of somebody's, you know, machinations. But it says you will not be utterly cast down. It says when, when, when men are cast down, you will say there's a lifting up. Why would you say so? Even though you have also just fallen, he says, no, I fell yesterday too. I believe God for A, B, C. It didn't happen. I couldn't pay for that thing. It was taken back from me. Hallelujah. Get up, get up, get up. Let's bless God. Let's do Come on. God is good. Before you know it, <laughs> well, because only a child will get up easily. <laughs> if I say let's dance, eh? Pastor dancing with another man's wife. Why didn't he call a brother to dance with him? Hey, you know, these are false fighting spirits at work. <laughs> All right. We are hedged in, pressed on every side, troubled. Oppressed in every way, but not crowned or crushed. Hallelujah. We suffer embarrassments and are perplexed and unable to find a way out, but not driven to despair. Magada Boka, verse 9. We are pursued, persecuted, and hard driven, but not deserted to stand alone. We are struck down bah, to the ground, but never struck out and destroyed. Stand and tell somebody you are, ne- you are never struck out. You may be struck down. You can never be struck out. You may be struck down. You can never be struck out. This is the word of the Lord. High five two persons. Tell them two tall people. Not short men like me. Two tall. <laughs> two tall people. Taller than me. Some of us are short too short. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Are you together? Are you still here? Glory to God. Hey. Amen. Don't ever be discouraged at all. You can't be struck out. It's not possible. You can never be struck out. It is never going to happen. Hallelujah. You can't be struck out. Let's thank God this morning. Service ends here. Yes, let's just give God the praise. Just bless his name. Just bless his name. Just bless God this morning. Hallelujah. Father, we return the praise to you. All the glory goes, goes back to you. Thank you, Lord Jehovah. We receive your word. We run with your word. In the name of Jesus. We know assuredly that we have the victory. At all times. Struck down many times, but not struck out. Never struck out. Thank you, Father. We exalt you. In Jesus' name.